working. Hello, I'm Toby Gain, Wessex Archaeology. Um, uh, I, I work, I'm a project manager, I work on a wide range of projects including development uh, projects for uh, commercial clients. Um, I also manage the dive team on behalf of um, our work for Historic England. Um, so this is kind of framed uh, it, with that experience. I've been, I've been doing that for the last seven years. Um, they say you should never start with an apology. <laughs> and uh, if you've read the abstract, you might think that this is going to descend into a, a horrific chest poking rant and stream of consciousness. Uh, it, it's actually not going to, but there are some issues uh, with underwater cultural heritage protection uh, that I think need to be highlighted and debated. Uh, there's no point in, in pretending they don't exist, they do. Um, you may not agree, uh, uh, and that's fine, and, and I also get things wrong, so please do, you know, if I've got something wrong, point it out to me and I will stand corrected. But yeah, thanks to, to Josh there, because you, you've underlined quite a few of the points that I think uh, may come out uh, as we go through this presentation. Um, I should also, also say as a caveat that what I'm about to talk about is my personal um, assessment of the situation um, and, and not necessarily one of uh, my organisation for a start or, or anyone else for that matter. Um, but yes, we'll, we'll see how that goes. All right. Okay, so I just wanted to kick off to frame uh, where we are in terms of relative wealth in the world. So we are actually one of the richest countries in the world. So we are the fifth largest economy in the world uh, and the second largest economy in Europe. And you would hope that with a country uh, as wealthy as ours that we might be able to look after our, our cultural heritage and where we are specifically talking about uh, in, in this session is underwater cultural heritage. So here's just some of the things we're going to go have a look at in this session. Um, this is where I think we're at. So heritage is under threat. I don't think there's any, uh, and again, I'm talking about underwater cultural heritage. I don't think there's any arguments about that. Um, currently, there's only one heritage protection mechanism used. And for the life of me, I can't really fathom out why that is the case, because there are others that could be used. Uh, we've got very limited resources put into underwater cultural heritage protection. And uh, one of the major issues with the marine environment is that in comparison to the terrestrial environment, very little is known about it. So we're starting off uh, from a point where really we don't know what's out there. We know a little bit, but not very much. Okay, so currently, uh, in terms of underwater cultural heritage protection, the uh, heritage authorities believe, or, or ha the remit is, out to the 12 nautical mile limit, which is the light blue shaded area around uh, England. I I'm just going to say, I, I am going to pick a little bit on historic England here, not for any other reason than... I, I work in England and I work with Historic England. The irony that they're sponsoring this session is not lost on me. Um, but, but I hope that, that this is going to you know, uh, frame a, a constructive conversation about how we might improve protection. So at the moment, we're looking at uh, that area there, which is uh, out to the 12 nautical mile limit. So that covers uh, about 21,000 square miles. You compare that to terrestrial, that's uh, you know, under half of, of what the, the, the terrestrial remit is. However, we all know, anyone that works uh, in, this, in this discipline knows, that cultural heritage doesn't stop at the 12 nautical mile limit. It carries on. Now, what happens to cultural heritage beyond that? So if we were to include the uh, contiguous zone, which is uh, a further 12 miles, uh, that would uh, make up about 35,000 square miles. So already we're getting up to where we are in, 
in terrestrial terms, we're starting to, to push that a bit. There's some people that believe that actually the heritage agency, agency should be dealing with everything in, in, in uh, English waters out to the continental shelf. Now, if we were to do that, that would be 80,000 square miles. So that actually dwarfs uh, the, uh, the area of, the, of terrestrial uh, remit. So uh, that's that area there, quite, quite big, just, just for England. Don't know why I've put that in again, but there you go. Okay, so. Of the sites in uh, English waters, uh, we, know, we know about about 6,000 wrecks, uh, somewhere in that order. Uh, I couldn't find a figure for lost records, so if anyone knows how many lost records there are, and, and Josh, you, I think, usefully put up a, a, a nice uh, schematic of that, but I think that number's going to be big. Uh, and also, fishermen's fasteners. Now, you, you might be looking at me and thinking, what, what's, what's he talking about fishermen's fasteners for? Uh, I haven't gone mad, because if you look at the 52 <coughs> protected wrecks uh, that, are, that are currently on, on the list um, for protection, uh, about 10 or 20, somewhere between 10 and 20 of those were found by fishermen snagging their nets on fasteners and then people going down to unsnag them and find out what they are. So we've got about 7,000 known fasteners, but I would hazard a guess that we don't know what those fasteners are <coughs> in, in the vast majority of cases. So if you extrapolate that, you know, 20% um, of protected wrecks that have been found as fishermen's fasteners, and you go and investigate those 7,000 fasteners, who knows what you will find? It's anyone's guess. And then if you look at what is actually protected on land, so we include listed buildings, scheduled ancient monuments, about, you know, 29,000 of, of those roughly and you compare that to the marine zone uh, well, we've got 52 protected wrecks uh, we'll, we'll throw in the, the 12 scheduled boats and ships which are actually on land just to bolster up the numbers a bit and military wrecks 34 of those and we've got 98 I don't think that that reflects the important heritage uh, that is in, in on the seabed. I, I really don't. And then let's just have a look at how we allocate resources to protect that. And this is from uh, Historic England's three-year corporate plan, which they've usefully put some of these figures in. So we've got about uh, 88 local authority uh, local authority sections looking after terrestrial. There's no one dedicated to marine among those. So we've got 323 uh, planning personnel looking after that 50,000 square kilometres that we talked about earlier. Or was it square miles? I think it's square miles. Uh, square miles earlier. Uh, and we've got three in marine for potentially up to 80,000 square miles, but perhaps we'll, we'll just stick to the 21,000 square miles. Uh, on the designation team, we've got 88 for terrestrial and two for marine. And in research, we've got 136 for terrestrial research. And how many have we got for marine? Absolutely zip. Now, I don't know about you, but I find that uh, slightly worrying, concerning. It's almost as if uh, the heritage agencies, and I think this is reflected throughout the devolved administration heritage agencies. I, again, I, I'm picking on Historic England a bit, um, but actually I think this is reflected throughout them all. 
uh, you know, really is, it, it looks as though the marine environment is just a bit of a problem that they don't really want to have to deal with. Oh, it's the message of doom. Right. Okay, so at the moment, we, I talked about this earlier, there's one single mechanism for protection. And again, please do let me know if I'm wrong. And, and that mechanism is uh, Protection of Rex Act, and we've got those 52 sites. Um, I have to say that I think the, the, um, the teams dealing with the casework in planning and designation on the marine side do an absolutely fantastic job. On the policy making side, and again, please do correct me if I've got this wrong, on the policy making side, A, there's no one with marine in their job title, not a single one. So this is the people that aren't on the ground, this is the people who are policy making decisions higher up within Historic England. And as far as I can see, there's no one with UK marine specific experience. So once again, I, I find that very concerning for, for our, our discipline. And there's a lot of other government bodies that interact with the marine environment and the marine historic environment that make the situation incredibly complex for those people having to deal with it, whether it be consultants, whether it be uh, the planning and designation teams, um, wh whoever's dealing with it, contractors. It's an incredibly complex situation. I think we we'll come on to that a bit later on. And UK her heritage policy is, I think, ignored. Now that might be a little bit controversial. I don't know. But I took the annex to the UNESCO convention to be UK heritage policy. And there are things that are absolutely clear within the annex that you cannot do, which are going on. Whether it be salvers, whether it be individuals selling cultural heritage for profit, all these things are going on that are absolutely forbidden in the annex. So, you know, it's absolutely clear. So again, we, we probably could have a, a discussion about whether the annex is UK heritage policy, but given that it's been cited as best practice by the UK government, yes, we're not a sig signatory to the UNESCO convention, but that annex should be applied and it's not being. Okay, I don't know if you've heard of these guys. These are, our, these are our, the French equivalent. Drassen Department of, uh, roughly translates it, Department of Underwater Archaeological Research. They employ 37 people. Uh, that's their vessel. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. Probably costs quite a bit of money. Probably costs quite a bit of money to run. Um, and they manage 11 million square kilometers. They manage the heritage uh, of 11 million square kilometers in French seas and French overseas uh, states or, or protectorates or whatever, or whatever you'd like to call them. They have a massive, massive remit. They do some fantastic research projects uh, and they've just commissioned a new 800,000 pound, 800,000 euro vessel, uh, not to replace that one, but to support it. So th this is an economy that's smaller than ours, and that's what they managed to do. So I was talking earlier about the, the complex situation in the UK in terms of uh, the different government departments that are involved in managing heritage uh, underwater. And so you've got DCMS, uh, you've got the MMO, you've got the Department for Transport, the MCA and the MOD all having a say with what goes on in respect of underwater cultural heritage in, in the UK. And that, that must be a, you know, an absolute nightmare to have to deal with that, I have to say. 
Um, the images I put up there, uh, just out of interest really, this, these are some images taken from a, a video uh, taken by the Shipwreck Project, who are a, um, uh, a charity that we've worked with who, who promote the investigation of, the, uh, of underwater cultural heritage. And they decided to do some work in France, got all the necessary permits, and uh, went over into French waters. And that's a French Coast Guard vessel putting a boarding party aboard the shipwreck project's vessel and checking that their paperwork was in order. Now, I'm, again, I, I'm quite happy to stand corrected, but I, I haven't heard of anyone in UK waters being boarded by the Coast Guard to check that their papers were in order or an MMO license was in place, anything like that. And I think all these different government departments probably aren't liaising enough, talking to each other enough, uh, cooperating enough, really. And, and uh, you know, I do appreciate it. it is very, very complicated. And uh, yeah, I just thought I'd put this one up. This is um, this is a converted um, fishing vessel, been converted into a salvage vessel. And I think this one is known to the authorities. It's Dutch owned. Uh, it's under a, uh, a flag of convenience, and it's actually been given MMO licenses. Has been given in the past an MMO license to work in UK waters uh, doing legitimate work, but there are uh, concerns that it might also be doing non-legitimate salvage work. And I think this is one of the problems, is that within all those government departments we just talked about, and, and the MMO is probably a key one, again, there is not anyone with archaeologist in their title cultural heritage, there's no expertise within that organisation. And as we've already seen, the resource provided to them by the heritage agencies is absolutely tiny. And they're, they're busy enough with casework as it is. So again, I think this is, this is highly concerning. And what I would say about Dutch and, and other nationality salvage vessels coming into UK waters is they've actually been kicked out of French waters, Belgian waters, Spanish waters, and they view UK waters as an open door, really, because they can come in and pretty much do what they want. Yes, they have to have certain licenses in place. Um, nonetheless, it is happening and uh, I think our waters are a bit of a testing ground for some of these salvers coming over at the moment. Um, and, and it's not just English waters, it, it's uh, uh, other, other um, devolved governments as well. Okay, we already talked about salvage law and Josh uh, mentioned the salvage uh, law issue. So we got uh, some of these guys, uh, this is a different Dutch salver, you may have seen this in the news, uh, coming over and salvaging illegally uh, sovereign immune wrecks from, from World War I in the North Sea. And Masig, Sipper Masig, collectively, we wrote to Navy Command and we said, what are you going to do about this? And the response back was, to, to sum it up, nothing. They're not going to do anything about it. Despite knowing who it was who did it, that there has been illegal activity taking place, they're not going to do anything at all about it. I don't know about you, but I find that pretty depressing. And again, I, th I think, you know, yes, there's a lot of different agencies, government agencies involved in that decision-making process, but it is overly complicated uh, and, and, and tricky. And clearly, the MOD has no uh, desire to, to do anything about that and, and prosecute anyone. Oh, was there another one? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, sal salvage law, I, I believe, is, is, is a problem. Um, so, reputation law, 
Fletcher and Rexack, 1973. This is the, the, the only thing really that's, that's currently used in, in English waters, despite there being other, other mechanisms available. Um, only, only, I mean, 52 sites is great, um, but really it's out of thousands, out of many thousands. And if you compare that to on land, it, it's, it's fractional, really. Um, and it can't really do anything except retrospectively. If, if a salver finds something uh, very uh, attractive in, in terms of what it wants to do as an activity, uh, then, then I'm guessing that you know, it's quite a, a, a process to try and put that protection in place. And it may be too late. Um, as Josh said, the, the legislation is, is quite archaic, really. And we've already heard uh, so, you know, some, some, in the previous presentation some great stories about the, the work that we do. And, and I think we all recognise just how, what a fantastic job the vast majority of the licensees on protected rec sites do. Um, but as direction of, uh, the protection of recs requires that the licensees are set up as salvers themselves, and what that means is that one or two of them, you may have seen it in the news, have been selling material from, from protected wrecks, but just outside of the area. Uh, a few of them have been involved in, in selling material from, from other sites. And again, this is contrary to UK heritage policy, but it is supported by wreck protection law. So there's very little that you can do. But I do want to stress that that is a, a small minority uh, of individuals and, and the vast uh, the, the vast majority of licensees do an absolutely fantastic job for nothing on our behalf really okay so I talked about there being other protection mechanisms available there's um, the uh, Ancient Monuments and Archaeological Areas Act 1979 now I think we all recognize that we want people to have access to historic sites and that is important uh, we want members of the public interested parties to have access one of the things that the protection recs act does is it, in, it inhibits it doesn't prevent but it inhibits uh, that access um, and for our most important sites that is absolutely pertinent however for a lot of other sites uh, a much better system would be to have protection in place it's a criminal offence to tamper with the wreck and the, actually the Archaeological Monuments and uh, the 79 Act is, is the perfect tool to be able to do that however that is not being used now I understand that that is the case on land as well I think there is a general reluctance to use that so it's not just the marine zone Nonetheless, that would be an incredibly useful tool for many, many sites in the marine zone. Historic battlefields. Uh, we, we've got astonishing marine landscapes such as uh, the Dover Barrage and all the associated submarines and ships uh, that, that were sunk there. An absolutely incredible landscape. Uh, historic battlefield. There's no, there's no reason why it can't be used underwater. But it, it, but it isn't being. Um, I even spoke to uh, the UNESCO guy, and he said um, that was in another session. Um, and he said there's no reason why world heritage status couldn't be applied underwater. So th you know there are other mechanisms that are available for uh, sites that are considered that that significant. So we've already talked about the mechanisms for protection really, really could be updated. Um, one of the ways of doing that would, would be to uh, ratify the UNESCO Convention, that, that might help. Um, more focus on, on access and, and less on what is quite outdated legislation and, and salvage law. So, um, underwater cultural heritage in the UK is being failed. I think I think we we all probably know that. Um, the UNESCO Convention would help, and it would also help simply to remove 
uh, historic wreck from the salvage regime. So again, everything at over 100 years old, simply remove it from salvage regime. That, that would just simplify everything enormously. I think that's it from me. <laughs> Except I've got that again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No? Yeah.